that little tidbit. Um, let's see, where do I start? Uh, this is not going to be a, I don't have prepared remarks, uh, which you're going to soon discover. Uh, but I am going to show you a few slides, and I think what I'll do is, is try to give you an overview of National Geographic, what we do, uh, because uh, something you said, uh, and, and this is something a lot of people say, it's, it's our biggest challenge, and it's, it's that uh, point about being an institution that we know from our childhood. Uh, so our, our biggest challenge these days is how do you take an organization that was founded in 1888, uh, had a remarkable uh, history, and bring it into the 21st century and keep it relevant uh, so that the organization can be as strong, as influential in the 21st century as it was in the 20th century. Um, and I'll say a little bit about that, but mostly what I want to do is, is talk to you about mission programs, which are all of the field research, exploration, expedition, uh, programs that we have, uh, as well as a few others that I'm responsible for. Um, and I'm particularly interested in technology uh, because I have told people over and over and over again that the 21st century will be the greatest age of exploration and discovery in the history of mankind. Uh, and the reason for that, uh, or at least a substantial uh, reason, is technology. Uh, and what technology is now allowing us to do uh, to pursue uh, questions and hypotheses that uh, we simply couldn't go after uh, sometimes even five years ago. Uh, and there's still a lot out there to explore. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about a, uh, a question or a, a, a call that came in uh, to National Geographic uh, for some reason, it came in through the, um, just the general number, and it was a recording uh, that left a voicemail. And the message was, uh, we have uh, found a, a, an interesting animal uh, which you think, we think you should know about, uh, and left a name and a number of, of uh, someone in uh, South America. Uh, so the... Um, uh, researchers passed it on to us and uh, the Committee for Research and Exploration and you know, listened to the voicemail and, and yeah, it sounded kind of interesting because it was, as described by this person, it was a very large animal. And so we called him up. Uh, it turns out that this person is a uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, well-respected uh, individual at a corporation in uh, Bolivia. Uh, and she had been asked to um, intervene because she was interpreting for this, uh, this gentleman. And the story was that they had found, this, this farmer in Bolivia had found a large snake. But not just a large snake, a 20 meter long anaconda. Now, we had heard for you know, years that there were uh, these large snakes, perhaps, uh, still in the jungles. And so decided, well, we're not going to write it off. It's kind of unusual, maybe unbelievable, but let's see what we can do. So we talked back and forth, and the farmer said, you know, was, the snake was 20 meters long, about 9 meters in diameter, about the right dimensions, uh, you know, big enough to eat a Ford Explorer or something uh, along those lines. And it had taken a team of oxen, uh, 16 oxen, uh, to pull this guy across the road and into a pen on the farmer's land where he was feeding it pigs. And he wanted to know, <laughs> he wanted to know what to do with it. And how do you feed an anaconda that's that large and keep him happy and satisfied? Um, so we consulted our anaconda expert and um, asked him. Uh, we drew up an anaconda contract for the uh, farmer to sign once we got there and um, found a um, camera and, and production team that we could send down. Not our best, but, you know, good enough. You don't want to send the best down to deal with a 20-meter-long anaconda. Uh, so these guys uh, took off, this, you know, plane, trains, automobiles. They finally had to uh, leave the, the automobile. They had to get on horseback. They took the horses as far as they could go. Then they had to walk up this steep incline. They finally make it to this guy's uh, farm. And where's the anaconda? He said, well... I saw one. I don't really have it. Now, the reason I tell you that, again, is that 
yes, it was far-fetched. Uh, yes, uh, it was improbable, but it wasn't so far-fetched and so improbable that we were willing to write it off because we know there are still things out there that we haven't found. Uh, so we'll start. Assuming now maybe we need to wake this guy up. Okay. Here we go. Okay, the um, the way we have uh, organized the mission programs at National Geographic is focused on three areas, exploration, incubation, and education is, is really the core organizing principles for what we're doing. And we've been doing this for more than 100 years. Uh, the Committee for Research and Exploration, which is uh, our uh, largest grant program, uh, makes about 300 grants each year uh, to field researchers and explorers around the world. Now, this is a peer-reviewed uh, committee, so the applications coming into the CRE are first reviewed by approximately 16 panelists who are uh, key experts in their area, and then it's farmed out for uh, peer review. Uh, and this committee over the years has funded some of the most significant work that the organization has done. Uh, our first grant, in fact, was to, uh, first archaeological grant was to Hiram Bingham uh, for the excavation of Machu Picchu. Uh, and that really set us on our way uh, in the field of archaeology. Uh, but over the years, we've funded the likes of Jane Goodall, uh, Richard uh, Leakey. Uh, we still, in fact, fund the, the Leakeys, uh, Bob Ballard, uh, Sylvia Earle. Uh, various and sundry other uh, stars in their particular fields. Uh, and the only requirement for one of these grants is to pass the peer review test. Uh, there's no media filter that we apply to it. So we hope that some small percentage of these grants will produce an interesting story, but uh, the purpose of the committee is to find and then support good science. Now, over the years, uh, we've also seen, and you know, this is, is something that's become more and more apparent. Uh, I've had literally hundreds of uh, photographers and explorers and scientists that have uh, come through my office, um, all of them on their way out to uh, do something, to seek the truth, uh, to explore. and they all come back as conservationists uh, because the one thing that they're finding now is that things are slipping away, that we're losing uh, the natural and cultural resources that make this such a fascinating place. Uh, and so we've created this conservation trust, which essentially is to do the same thing as the Committee for Research and Exploration, but to focus its resources on conservation work. We also have an expeditions council. We've got 11 different grant committees, and I'm not going to take you through each of them, but uh, these are the major ones. This one is editorially driven. We're looking for good science, but in this particular uh, program, we're looking for ideas that will give us an opportunity to tell a compelling story. And then just here, here's just a few of the other grant programs, and they range from um, a uh, program that's designed to provide resources quickly uh, to researchers who just want to get out in the field. They have a question that they want to try and answer. It's essentially uh, that first survey work that needs to be done. Uh, we've streamlined it. There's no peer review as such. There's a small committee that reviews the proposals. We're doing this in connection with uh, Ted Waite, uh, who uh, some of you may know from um, uh, gateway fame, and the idea is to put a hundred of these out each year uh, and hope that maybe five are going to pay off. Another program that we have is a remote imaging uh, lab, and uh, we've spent a lot of time over the last uh, several years creating um, 
imaging equipment that is animal born. Uh, we started with uh, whales and basically have worked our way down the chain there so that we're getting smaller and smaller. And I'm hoping that you guys uh, have some uh, technology that may allow us to take this even further uh, because it's become a, a key part of the research program as well as our media. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about some of the projects that we'd like to do and the, or that we're in the process of uh, organizing. You know, the, the last time that a human being went to the deepest point on the planet uh, was in the 1960s. Uh, think about how many times we've been to the moon. Think about how many times we've put uh, a human being in orbit, and yet we've been to the deepest point on the planet only once. Uh, and so what we're proposing is that it's time to go back. Uh, time to go back for a lot of reasons. Uh, principally, though, because uh, we think that it's time to begin focusing public attention on the challenges and problems that are confronting the oceans. Uh, and using a uh, project like this to begin to galvanize public interest and hopefully uh, public support is something that uh, we think will be worth the effort. This, by the way, is what went down the last time. And here's where we'd like to go. Here's another example of um, technology. We, um, we've been working with the Egyptian authorities, and this is a project that was originally designed to uh, study the uh, epidemiology, the, the history in all of the mummies that the Egyptians have in their possession of health and disease in ancient Egypt. And uh, the proposal was to use a CAT scan. And one of the first uh, mummies out of the chute, so to speak, uh, was King Tut. Uh, and King Tut was of interest to us uh, for a number of reasons. One, there's been almost, what, 80, 90 years of marketing behind that, that King Tut brand, and so people are very interested in him. Uh, but how did he die? Uh, you know, archaeologists have speculated over the years that uh, perhaps he was murdered. Uh, there were a series of x-rays that were taken in the 60s and then again in the 70s that seemed to indicate that he had suffered a blow to his skull. There was a small bone fragment that was found. And, uh, it was a reasonable uh, suggestion, uh, but we wanted to take a look and see what we could uh, determine. Uh, and so the Siemens Corporation was kind enough to give us one of their latest, uh, most advanced uh, CAT scan machines. Uh, and we found out a lot of things about this mummy. Uh, we found out, first of all, that uh, Tut, who was about 19 years old, uh, was in good health. Uh, you do see that he had a bit of a, uh, an impacted wisdom tooth. Um, but otherwise, pretty good uh, dental hygiene. Uh, he did not die from a blow to the head. Uh, there was no evidence whatsoever of any trauma uh, to his skull. Uh, but what we did find was that, you know, go back a minute, that uh, he had suffered a serious fracture uh, of his left leg uh, and that this fracture had occurred within 24 hours to five days of his death based upon evidence in the uh, CAT scans indicating the, the rate at which it had been uh, healing. Uh, so, uh, we solved one mystery and then created another because how did he uh, come to sustain this serious fracture and did that fracture contribute to his death? Maybe, maybe not. This is also another example of, uh, if not technology, new science. Uh, you know, we've, for years, uh, Anthropologists and archaeologists have studied the migratory patterns of the human race. Uh, this is a project that's using genetics to uh, map the migratory history of our species. Uh, basically, how did we come to populate this planet uh, as a species? And by using genetics and 
finding a particular mutation, we're able to, if you're a man, take you back 60,000 years ago to when the first individual, in this case the, uh, the, the, the anthropologist will excuse this, but the scientific Adam left uh, Africa and then plot the migratory path of that person's ancestors. Uh, and it will give us at the end of five years uh, what we believe will be the most comprehensive map of human migration that has ever been compiled. Uh, it will consist of samples from 100,000 individuals from indigenous communities around the world. Uh, we have set up a series of uh, laboratories. There are 11 labs around the world uh, that are staffed uh, by geneticists uh, and they're each responsible for obtaining their samples. Uh, we're about halfway through the project. We're on target. Uh, the, we're lagging just a little bit behind in North America and in Australia. Um, because of, of, basically because of political issues, uh, there are, there's considerable sensitivity in North America and in Australia, both of whom have very sophisticated uh, indigenous communities, politically sophisticated, and uh, have raised objections to this kind of research. Uh, so we're continuing to consult with the various communities and uh, hopefully persuade them that this is a project that is designed for no other purpose than to understand migration. Uh, there are no medical uses, no commercial uses. Uh, it's anonymous. If anyone wants to pull out of it, they may pull out at any time, whether at the beginning or the end. Uh, if the entire community wants out, we'll pull it out and destroy all the uh, materials. Uh, and so hopefully we'll be able to um, add the, uh, the North American samples. Now also, uh, one of the uh, interesting components to this is that we wanted to do more than just uh, have a traditional research project. And so uh, we invited the public to participate. And so any member of the public can purchase a simple cheek swab kit for $100 and they will get their results. Uh, and we're using this cheek swab kit as a way of financing the research. The research program itself is about a 10 to $11 million program uh, and $25 of that $100 research kit goes back to the, uh, the research project. The other 75 is basically the cost of doing the testing. Uh, it's the first time that we've used a uh, massive public participation as a way of uh, funding a project like this. Uh, here's a, another interesting project. Um, about uh, seven years ago, uh, Bob Ballard uh, came to us, and uh, some of you may know him, some may not, but he is um, a, uh, an explorer, a, basically a marine archaeologist these days. Uh, and Bob wanted to investigate a phenomenon that uh, had been uh, written about, but no one had been able to prove it. Uh, and the, the, the notion is, is basically this, that about 7,000 years ago, the Black Sea was a very small freshwater lake. Uh, and as the glaciers were receding around the world uh, and in Europe, the glacial melt flowing down the plains of Europe uh, was steadily raising the sea level. Now, because of the topography of this area, the Black Sea, this little lake, uh, was unaffected. But as the sea level rose in the Mediterranean, eventually it burst through the Bosphorus and you had a flood, uh, a cataclysmic flood, maybe a flood of biblical proportions. And could we prove that, in fact, there had been this flood? And could we prove that there was a small freshwater lake that existed 7,000 years ago? Well, long story short, we were able to do that. Uh, we found the ancient shoreline. We were able to take samples. Uh, we were able to determine that there were uh, species uh, that were both freshwater and saltwater and that the dividing line was almost exactly 7,000 years ago uh, where it moved from freshwater extinct species to saltwater species. So uh, the proof uh, apparently was there. But what we discovered uh, was even more interesting. Uh, we discovered that the Black Sea is uh, anoxic. Uh, and that there is a thin layer at the top, uh, and it varies uh, where it is oxygenated and you have marine life, but below it, it is dead. 
It's dead, 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 dead. I mean, it's, you, you've never seen anything like this. Well, what that meant is that as for an archaeologist, uh, you have just struck pay dirt because the enemy of all, first of all, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of ships in the Black Sea. Uh, if you think about what was happening over the years, over the centuries, major trading routes, uh, the Romans, and so hundreds of these went down. The big enemy of a wooden ship are wood bores. Uh, if you look at most uh, sites that are excavated, for example, in the Mediterranean, you'll see at best the uh, ship splayed open like this, and then the cargo spread out over the, the floor, but nothing else. Uh, very little wood survives. Well, in the Black Sea, since there is no oxygen, there are no wood bores. Uh, there's nothing for them to live on. And so, in theory, you should find perfectly preserved wood, perfectly preserved ancient ships. So as these things go, uh, on the very last day of a two-month project, we came across this. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, uh, you'll see the mass. Uh, it rises about 30 feet off the bottom of the floor. You can still see the lashings on the mast. And then you can see various uh, uh, parts of the ship, uh, the uh, as marks on the wood. Uh, this, at first the, the um, uh, marine archaeologist on board said, well, it's got to be a recent vessel. It can't be more than 200, maybe 300 years old max. Uh, turns out that it is a Byzantine vessel, uh, circa, uh, say, 400, 500 AD. Uh, it is perfectly preserved. There's a, there's a thin layer of silt. You can see the robot working on it now. Uh, we haven't gotten through the deck. Uh, one of the big questions now is if wood is preserved, what else will it preserve? Presumably any organic matter. Uh, so humans? Maybe. Uh, I've, uh, this is, a, as I said, a project of Ballard's. I've told him that he cannot stop until he finds the skeletons hunched over the oars of one of these ships, and then they may go home. Now, another project involving technology is in Egypt. In fact, there, there are several of them. One, uh, which I'm hoping to talk to uh, some of the, the uh, people in this room about, uh, is a project that we have right now with the Supreme Council on Antiquities in Egypt uh, in the Valley of the Kings. Now, this is not the Valley of the Kings. This is Giza. Uh, but uh, Zahi Hawass, who is the uh, Secretary General, great title, Secretary General of the Supreme Council on Antiquities uh, in Egypt, uh, has asked us uh, to work with him to do a survey of the Valley of the Kings. Uh, using ground penetrating radar and other technology. Uh, it's the first time it's ever been done. In fact, it'll be the first time, at least on this scale, that it's been done at a major World Heritage Site. Uh, so in addition to yielding what we hope would be some very interesting uh, archaeological finds, it also could be uh, the first time a comprehensive site management plan has been developed using this technology and I would hope uh, could be the uh, leading example uh, for other World Heritage Sites. But in addition to that one, uh, in Giza, there is another project that we're very interested in. This is the Great Pyramid, Khufu's Pyramid. Uh, and there are, there are actually three chambers in that pyramid. Uh, you see at the top, uh, K is the king's chamber. Uh, the one all the way down below, C, is called the unfinished chamber. And then right there in the middle, uh, F, is the queen's chamber. Uh, our arbitrary names, uh, we, we don't know actually what they were used for. But there's a, an interesting thing about the queen's chamber. Uh, it has two shafts. There's a southern shaft and a northern shaft. And they go about, from what we can tell, 200 feet, approximately 200 feet on each side. Uh, and at the 
end of the shaft, there is a small door. And these are, the shafts are, say, uh, slightly larger than this screen here. So they're relatively small. Um, but at the end of the shaft, there is a door. Uh, it's made out of limestone. In fact, it's, it appears to be made out of the finishing stone that the Egyptians used. So it would have been Turin limestone, the finest quality. Uh, and there are two brass handles on the door. Uh, so several years ago, uh, we foolishly decided we would do a live television program. And we are never doing this again. We learned do not do live television when you're dealing with archaeology, um, unless you're prepared for the consequences. Uh, so we um, had a robot constructed. Uh, that would scoot up this chamber. Uh, the robot was capable of uh, drilling a small hole in this door. You see right here, and you see live. Um, we, we got permission from the Egyptians to draw a small hole in that door and stick a camera in it. And what do you think we found? Another door just like the first one. So uh, we were waiting around, not much else to do after the show ended, and Dr. Hawass said, this is magnificent, this is very interesting, and we go, you know, cut over, uh, say goodbye. Um, decided to send that robot up the northern shaft, and it scooted up the northern shaft. In fact, the shaft is kind of interesting because it takes a turn, but it's the same distance, and at 200 feet exactly, there is another door, so three doors, uh, identical to the other two, uh, same type of limestone, same brass handles, uh, and we're now uh, working on convincing, and the Egyptians have indicated that they are prepared to do this, sending another robot up. So that's another area where perhaps we can talk, because so far, uh, there have been two teams that have come in, uh, a team from Hong Kong uh, and John, I think it was Singapore, yeah, uh, that were the finalists and had proposed to um, uh, carry out this project. Their robots failed in the test, uh, so they're, everyone is back at the drawing board. Um, here is a project that, in fact, I didn't know we were doing until I read in the London Times uh, yesterday uh, that Dr. Hawass announced that uh, we and um, the Egyptians and Bob Ballard were going to go find Menkare sarcophagus for him, uh, which sank off of the coast of Spain uh, in 1838 or so uh, and has been sitting there. It's a stone sarcophagus, uh, not particularly interesting, except that uh, it is uh, uh, from one of the, uh, the, the large pyramids. Uh, and we're figuring that if the British were able to cart off the stone sarcophagus, pretty much anything else that wasn't nailed down was likely on that ship with it as well. Uh, and so uh, at Dr. Hawass's invitation, we're um, presently looking to see if we can um, obtain a platform and convince the Spanish authorities to allow us to go searching for it. All right, this is a, another um, project that we've been quite interested in. It's the Franklin Expedition. Some of you may be familiar with it, but uh, it involved two ships. Uh, it was in the mid-1800s. Uh, John Franklin uh, led one of the largest, best equipped expeditions to the Arctic. Uh, the ships uh, were never seen again. Uh, the men disappeared. It's been a mystery now for more than a century as to what happened to them. There were stories of internal conflict, uh, of poisoning, of cannibalism, uh, all the things that make for a great story in television, uh, but also a a wonderful mystery that has yet to be answered. So uh, something that we would like to pursue, and again, an example where technology is going to make it feasible. I'm going to move through these so that uh, 
See, even, there are even dinosaurs in the ocean. Um, this is uh, uh, a ship that uh, Paul Serino, uh, paleontologist out of the University of Chicago, is uh, hoping to convince us to uh, go looking for and uh, includes a complete um, hadrosaur skeleton at, sitting on the ocean floor. And then an assortment of other uh, projects that uh, have come to our attention. Um, a couple of, of uh, new ones uh, that are fairly interesting. One of them uh, we're still investigating, but I'm intrigued by it. Uh, in the uh, early 1900s, the uh, French convinced the royal family of Laos that the royal treasures would be safer uh, if the French were allowed to take them to the Louvre. Uh, and the uh, royal family agreed to allow the French to take their royal treasures. Uh, they were loaded onto a boat. Uh, it went down the Mekong and it sank. Uh, and it sat there. Uh, in 1968, an expedition was put together uh, involving the British uh, as well as some French. They went looking for it, and they found it, or at least purportedly found it. Um, the uh, team on the last day was packing up. They weren't going to, to excavate. They packed up. They got on the plane. The plane circled one last time for them to see the, the wreck site and crashed. Uh, and no one has been after it since. Uh, by the way, the monks... Uh, when the French first wanted to take this out, put a curse on the ship and anyone who tried to remove that treasure from Laos. So we're going to first talk to the monks. Uh, <laughs> if, if, yeah. Uh, make sure that they understand we don't want to take this out of Laos. It's yours. Uh, we're, we're just here to see if we can locate it and, and bring it up and return it to the royal family. Uh, but it's a fabulous uh, story and project, and a number of people have looked for it. And then the, the other one that just came to our attention involves Kublai Khan. Uh, and uh, he, um, he was a, a busy fellow, uh, and in addition to invading a, or attempting to invade a no number of countries, including Japan, he also tried to invade Vietnam. Uh, and he had a fleet of ships, hundreds of ships, uh, that uh, were part of this invasion fleet, and they came into a river, and as they went into the river, the, uh, as the tide went out, of course the le river level went down, and the Vietnamese had uh, put spikes in the bottom of this river, so sort of the early punji sticks, uh, and the ships became trapped and stuck on these spikes, and the invasion fleet was essentially destroyed. Well, we just got a report that uh, the, they believe that they have found uh, not just the site, but the ships. They've found uh, these large spikes now in the river, and so a team is being put together to go back. There's some preliminary work that has to be done uh, to look for it, but it, it appears that because it's in this rice paddy and there's a lot of mud, that we have another anoxic or semi-anoxic environment where the uh, ships may be uh, in a state of preservation that one would not ordinarily expect. Now I'm going to move quickly through the rest of this stuff uh, so that we can take questions. Uh, we do, as part of our work, we want to identify and support talent, new talent, uh, and existing talent. We have a program called Explorers in Residence, which is really just a program that brings uh, closer to the organization, some of the, the top people in their fields, the fields that we've owned over the years. Uh, we have a visiting fellows program, and because I didn't have his photograph, because he didn't <laughs> tell me I was going to be doing this, uh, you see only Maurizio uh, down there in the corner. We don't have his photograph, or at least I didn't have it on my laptop this afternoon at uh, 1 o'clock when I did this. Um, and the third program is a new one. It's called Emerging Explorers, and really it's a simple premise. Go out and identify each year 10 to 12 individuals who represent uh, that next generation of talent. 
uh, the individuals who are going to be taking over where a lot of these uh, explorers and residents and other established uh, scientific talent have left off and provide them with support. And so uh, it's now in its uh, fifth year or so. Uh, each year we identify, as I say, 10 to 12 of these individuals uh, and provide them with a small stipend and then do our best to work with them over a period of time to help them with their careers, identify uh, projects that um, uh, we could be of assistance on. We also uh, take the, the idea of incubation seriously and also want to incubate ideas and programs. We're working with several people now on a, a project that will be looking at um, really issues that are going to be confronting us uh, in the, uh, the last half of this century. Just a couple of quick things on what we do in education. Uh, we have obviously our media that uh, uh, deals with reaching a, a broad public uh, we've created a program called the Center for Sustainable Destinations because you know the largest, one of the largest industries in the world is tourism. Uh, it has a tremendous impact on uh, the environment and it has the potential for having uh, the, a tremendously positive impact if uh, done correctly and so we're working with uh, governments and organizations, uh, academic uh, institutions on this concept. Uh, we're also working on several major initiatives. One of them is going to be focused on the oceans. Uh, in the initial phase, we're going to be uh, launching a five-year program that will be uh, focused on exploring the last pristine places uh, on the planet. Uh, we'll select two each year, and so at the end of five years, uh, have visited ten of these, really with the purpose of uh, establishing a baseline. What does a pristine system look like? Uh, most of what we know today and most of what you study when you're um, studying oceanography uh, and the systems in the ocean uh, based on degraded systems. We, we know very little about what a truly pristine system looks like and there are a few um, uh, left out there. Uh, just a quick word on this again. It's, you know, focusing on the, the uh, plight of uh, some of the large predators and other species. Uh, lions are a good example. There were some 200,000 wild lions uh, a generation or so ago. Uh, this number, 28,000, is optimistic. Uh, there are probably fewer than 20,000 wild lions left on the continent of Africa today. Uh, this program will be designed to um, look for solutions. Uh, then, just quickly, we've got live programs with lectures. We have a uh, film festival. We've created a, a, um, a music uh, program that's focused on uh, world music, traveling exhibits. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It just opened. Um, I spent four years working on this uh, and, and numerous trips to Afghanistan. Um, and it's, it's an interesting story. Um, just before the Soviets invaded uh, Afghanistan in the late 70s, uh, a Soviet archaeologist, Viktor Serenidi, uh, was doing work in northern Afghanistan and uh, he found uh, six burials uh, of nomads. And it turned out that these were not ordinary nomads. These were, uh, if you will, royal nomads. Uh, and in these graves were 20,000 pieces of solid gold jewelry, uh, ranging from bracelets to the collapsible crown that you see there. Uh, and it's a remarkable example of the uh, work that these people did because they took the influence from China, from India, uh, Greece, and melded it into a particularly unique um, art form of their own. Uh, when the Russians invaded, uh, just prior to the invasion, all of this was packed up, it was hurriedly inventoried, it was sent back to Kabul, and then it disappeared. Uh, and for 20 plus years, no one knew what had happened. Uh, we had assumed that, well, it had been stolen, or it had been melted down, uh, it had been destroyed by the Taliban, 
or taken away by the Mujahideen. Uh, and then in 2003, there, was a, there were rumors that uh, Karzai had been uh, milling around in the basement of the uh, national, old Kabul National Bank, which is inside the presidential compound, and was able to confirm that uh, some of the, the treasury was still intact. And oh, by the way, there are these boxes down there that may contain some of the artifacts from the museum. Long story short, uh, we went to Kabul, uh, spent uh, several weeks there working with the Afghans, trying to convince them to work with us. Uh, and uh, sure enough, in a subterranean vault, uh, there were seven safes uh, that had been sitting there. Uh, and the remarkable thing is that these safes had been protected by a conspiracy of silence from the curators of the Kabul Museum about half a dozen people who had decided that uh, protecting their cultural heritage was more important uh, than anything else. Uh, in fact, so important they were willing to risk their lives for it. And so they hid it. Uh, they lied. Uh, they built false doors and rooms. They took the Taliban down and broke the key in one of the safes and said, oh my, it's broken, sorry. Um, we'll have to send off to Germany because it's a special lock. Uh, and used all of these ruses to protect this treasure. And every single piece was there. And it's now on uh, exhibition at the National Gallery. And it'll be in San Francisco uh, in about three months. So I think what I'm going to do is stop. We have various education programs and go on and on and on. Uh, but uh, leave it at, uh, at that. I should say on the, the media side, not to forget it, uh, because the media is a key piece of what we do. It's used to communicate all of this wonderful stuff. Uh, but we uh, publish our magazine in 27 languages. Uh, we broadcast in 25 plus languages in 160 or so countries. It keeps going up. Uh, each month, reach about 400 million people. So let me stop there. I'm happy to take questions. Um, the next time I come back, I'll have a truly prepared uh, uh, presentation for you, and um, thanks. Um, Terry, I, I noticed that uh, you use the term geotourism, mm -hmm. and we're, you know, most often we hear the word ecotourism. I'm wondering what, what is the difference? Well, ecotourism generally is focused on green tourism. Uh, what we wanted to do was to have a much broader definition uh, and focus not just on the environment, but on cultural, social, political aspects, the geography of a country, everything that makes a place unique. Uh, because it's not just preserving the uh, wildlife or the landscape, it's preserving the cultural history, the heritage, the ways. Uh, and so the concept is to have all of this and bring it together. And this program works uh, with the local population to identify those things that are most unique uh, and interesting about a place. In the back. Um, that works. Yeah, amount of appreciation. In India, I just noticed that uh, the National Geographic Channel has a huge influence on uh, people's perception of the world. Um, they get a television, cable's pretty common, and um, National Geographic Channel, you can see it, you know, walking through shanty towns. And um, I just wanted to throw that out there because yeah, I think you it's know, having a really huge effect. Yeah, thanks. It, it, uh, India happens to be one of our strongest uh, television markets and in fact Asia generally is very strong and one of the things that you see uh, on the international channel and the, the 
it says a lot about um, Western culture and, and American culture in particular, whereas here in the U.S., a lot of our programming is developed and unfortunately focused on the lowest common denominator uh, and witness the reality shows that have crept into most of the network programming these days. Uh, whereas when you travel to India uh, or to any number of other uh, countries, the appetite for information about history, uh, about culture, uh, about uh, the environment is so much higher uh, and the demand is so much greater that th there's a, th there is a palpable uh, difference. And um, it's good for us. Uh, and uh, not so good for the uh, American uh, viewing public, although we're continuing to try to, to get our message across there. I, I, one other thing I'd say is that, you know, we, we're trying to do more with this programming than just entertain people. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Uh, some years back, a scientist came to us. Uh, his name is Mike Fay. And he said, I want to do a transect. I'm going to walk uh, from Congo to Gabon, and I'll, I'll catalog everything that I see along the way. Uh, and it's 2,000 miles, and I'm going to do it on foot. Uh, and it's incredibly rigorous. It's the last pristine place on, uh, one of the last pristine places on that continent. Uh, and we thought, well, this is going to be good. This will be a great story. Uh, there's some good science here, but this guy is truly nuts. And so something good is going to come out of this. Uh, and so we sent him out there, and he started walking and walking, um, and he spent two years at it. And he cataloged and documented everything that he saw. Uh, and one of the reasons he was doing this, aside from the science, was that this was an area that was now uh, being logged. In fact, it was on the verge of, of being heavily logged. Uh, and Mike wanted to bring attention to what was going on. And so when he got back, we set him up, sat him down, and he started pulling together all of his images. And uh, we created a television show, uh, three magazine articles. We put him out on the lecture circuit. And he and the photographer, Nick Nichols, went out there and would, they talked to anybody who would listen. And uh, they met, finally, uh, interestingly enough, with the president of Gabon and his cabinet. Uh, and at the end of the meeting, the president uh, agreed that he would set aside 10% of the land area of Gabon uh, as national park land solely as a result of what this one guy did with a little bit of help from the media and the images. And so it shows you the, the impact that the media can have uh, in moving uh, policymakers and the public. Uh, he didn't have to do it. I, in fact, my, my guess is that he was probably just tired of being beaten up by this guy because it was relentless uh, every day. You know, these images and remarkable images because you, you know, there, there's a beach there where you can go out and see hippos uh, surfing in the water, uh, elephants walking down the, uh, the beach. I mean, it's one of those remarkable places, uh, one of the jewels of the planet that uh, very few of them exist. But there's an example of what you can do with the media and if you hit it at the right point in time. Hi, I'm Larry Smar. I'm the director of this two-campus thing, and I'll be up at Irvine and communicating with you tomorrow by, yeah. by definition. Um, love this stuff. I had a question, though. Um, you know, when you look at life on Earth, it's easy to think of it in terms of the macroscopic life, which is a tiny fraction of the life on mm -hmm. Earth, which is almost, uh, by many orders of magnitude, microbial. And there's a great exploration of that space now of, of, of a kind that, you know, 150 years microbiology has not investigated it. Yeah. Um, and uh, we're finding more and more that, for instance, you have 10 cells of microbes on your body for every human cell you have. You'll have 100 times as many genes in those microbes as you do in your cells as a human. Um, and this is a discovery. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really just happening as we speak, you know. 
Um, and I wonder whether National Geographic has gotten into that because it's such a new takeoff field. Craig Venner, of course, was the person who really led yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, and we know Craig. Yeah. Uh, we're very interested. And, you know, we're always looking for ideas. Uh, we're always looking for new stories and different ways of telling old stories. Uh, and so, you know, I would encourage you when you have ideas and suggestions like that to shoot an email to us. Hi. But no snakes. No, no anacondas. I'm just I'm completely over the anaconda stuff now. Well, I don't know if I should ask this question <laughs> then. <laughs> but uh, I had the pleasure of meeting one of your freelance photographers, Gilles Nicolet, and he mm. did a lot of photography in Cameroon. He would literally stick his lens into snake burrows, um, these oh, yeah. large pythons, and he got these amazing shots of the pythons with their mouths wide open. He also did a series on honey hunters and would climb up trees, you know, hundreds of feet in the air. So my question is, are there ever projects that you turn down because they are too dangerous? I know that you look for people who are adventurous and, mm -hmm. as you said in your own words, nuts, but I wonder if there are projects you turn down. Yeah, there are. Um, there are some places that are too dangerous to work in right now. Uh, we pulled people out of uh, Iraq. Uh, we have there have been some times where we've we've uh, had to postpone and, and delay work in Afghanistan. But there, yeah, there there are uh, projects where we'll make a determination that we simply uh, can't uh, responsibly send someone in the field to do that. Uh, most, of, most of the people that we work with, however, uh, approach these in a very thoughtful manner. I mean, they, there are risks. There are always going to be risks in this type of work. Um, but you don't want to take unnecessary risk. And so we, part of the grant review process is to satisfy ourselves that uh, the team is competent and that they know what they're doing and that they have the capability of dealing with any contingencies. Because once you're out there, uh, many times you're, you're on your own. There's not a lot that we can do. Um, you know, it helps that you're National Geographic. That'll get you out of a lot of difficult situations. And I've, I've, I've used that in the past, and it, it will work within reason. But, um, you know, you've, you've, you've got a pretty self-reliant group of people that come to us. And so, uh, but yes, there are some times where we don't want to send people out. Uh, but... The world is full of, not full, there, there, are some, um, there are some unique individuals out there who are willing to do this sort of thing. And it takes a unique personality, because uh, just think about it, this guy, Mike Fay, uh, day after day for two years, uh, a pair of shorts and Tevas was basically the equipment he had, uh, and three bouts of malaria. Uh, various other uh, parasites and, and uh, obstacles that he uh, encountered, and yet he just he kept doing it because he was driven. And the, the one thing that all of these people have in common is that they are driven. Uh, they are obsessed with whatever it happens to be. Uh, and they're, they're obsessed to the point where nothing else matters. They're going to achieve that objective and you know, quite frankly, without those people, we, we wouldn't have the advances that we've had over the years. And so you need them. Uh, I'm, I'm privileged to be able to work with many of these people. And so it's a, it takes a, a, unique, uh, a unique mind and, and personality to do this stuff. Right, right. Well, we get those every now and then. The, the guys that wanted to drive a NASCAR into a tornado so that they could observe the... Uh... <laughs> Um, and one other, it, it, the, 
there's a, in the, the next magazine, and it'll be on National Geographic Television, we, we did a story uh, about Virunga, and this goes to John's point about people. Uh, you may remember that about a year ago, uh, there was pretty widespread coverage about uh, the killing of four uh, gorillas uh, in Virunga. There are about 700 mountain gorillas left. Um, well, they, they weren't just killed, I mean, they, and they weren't killed by poachers. They were executed, uh, murdered, just systematically shot, a family of, of four. And we wanted to find out why, uh, what was the back story. And so you'll, you'll see that, so you'll be able to read about it in the magazine and see the, the show. But basically what it turned out was that it all turned on one thing, greed, of course, uh, and the charcoal trade. Uh, at least in, in this part of Africa, charcoal has become the blood diamond. Uh, and so organized crime, uh, was, a syndicate was basically running this business uh, in the forest, and it's hardwood. They would go in, chop down the trees, uh, and it's a $30 million a year business. Well, one of the rangers was becoming a bit of a nuisance. He was on to the game, and he was uh, starting to crack down on it. And uh, the um, uh, bad guys decided they were going to frame him, and so they pinned the killing of the gorillas on this uh, ranger. I'm not going to tell you how the story ends, but that's when we talk about the, the threats out there, they generally are from other people, uh, and that's a perfect example. So Terry, with all these uh, wonderful stories uh, that you get to oversee, develop, where do you plan to go for your next vacation? <laughs> Yeah, well, San Diego. Um, you know, I'm I, I'm, uh, I'm I'm trying to get into Libya right now. Uh, I've uh, I've had scheduled twice now a trip uh, in the last couple of weeks, and it's been postponed. Uh, but we would dearly love to uh, get into that country and begin doing some archaeological work, uh, both. <coughs> Uh, land-based as well as marine. Uh, the opportunities off the coast of Libya, which has not been um, thoroughly surveyed, are tremendous. And so uh, hopefully third time is the charm, and I'll be over there uh, sometime in, uh, in July. Um, and then in July, we're, we're, we have one other interesting project. We're taking a group of um, thought leaders uh, to the Arctic uh, for 10 days, and uh, it's an experiential voyage to basically show them what is happening uh, and see the, um, the consequences of uh, climate change uh, in work, at work. Actually, I, I have a question to, over here. I was uh, wondering, when you first started the talk, you mentioned that uh, National Geographic's, one of their major concerns right now is bringing them uh, into the new century with, uh, while maintaining a bit of relevance. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most tangible things that's happened in the last century is the development of new technologies and advancements in science and technologies. And in this room, there's a bunch of people from many different backgrounds of science and, and uh, disciplines and things like that, and, and we're wondering if, if there's ways in which these sciences and, and uh, disciplines might be able to be combined into a multidisciplinary task in order to help uh, explore in, in multifaceted ways, for example, development of new ways in which it's maybe non-destructive with that Queen's Room, uh, yeah, yeah, thing, yeah. things like that, but it seems like Cal IT and UCSD in general has a, a lot of motivation to try to combine all those different facets together. So I guess that's why you're here, and, and what do you see as, as some possibilities and in inroads into the future? Well, that's a great point. I, you know, um, that is why we're here, and, and uh, we had a, a team from National Geographic here yesterday, uh, the head of our large format film group, as well as the remote imaging uh, lab, and uh, we'll be seeing some demonstrations uh, today and tomorrow, and the hope is that we'll be able to identify a number of areas in which we can collaborate with the university on these projects, because you have, you have some amazing technology and talent here that, just as you point out, 
could be brought to bear on solving some of the problems that these researchers, scientists, explorers are encountering right now in the field, uh, particularly uh, technology that allows us in a non-invasive way to uh, explore. So, yeah, absolutely. That's that's the whole reason for being here. And uh, we're, we're here because Maurizio Saracini, uh, who we were fortunate enough to uh, meet and get involved with his wonderful project uh, in Florence, uh, said, you've got to come back out and uh, you've just seen the tip of the iceberg with, with me. I want to show you what uh, what kind of talent is at this university, and I, I have to say that it's it's remarkable. It's it's just incredibly impressive. So I think that I think we're going to be able to do something. Uh, Terry, uh, you talked about the uh, genographic project. Yeah. What are you doing right now? Because I assume you're getting a lot of data coming in. Where is all that being housed, and is it going to be made available, not just specifically to the public, but to scientists who might be able to do their own, run their own algorithms against the data that's Yes, coming. yes. Um, yes, if, if, if they, you know, I mean, they'll have to agree to certain conditions uh, because we had to, to stipulate to certain things with the institutional review boards that approve the project, but absolutely it's going to be available. Uh, and, you know, we're hoping that this information is going to allow us to make significant advances in this field. Um, they're still collating information. A couple of papers have been published. Uh, we're just now at the point where we should start seeing some interesting results. Uh, it, it's taken us a while to get there, but over the next two years, I think we're going to see some remarkable things uh, because no one has ever done this. No one has ever looked at migration uh, using genetics. And uh, for that reason alone, we should find something that's very interesting and significant in, in all that data. Um, I, I'd say one interesting thing that has already come out of it, though, is that we're finding that the public participation side is actually yielding some very interesting information. We didn't think that it was going to be um, as fruitful as it's turned out to, to be. Uh, feeling that, you know, the, the work within the indigenous communities was going to yield the most information, but that's actually not true. And the, one of our partners in that project is IBM. Uh, we, we could not have done this alone, so it's another example of why we have to partner with other organizations. They had the computing power, and when we went to them, they were looking for, you know, their next big blue. Uh, and it wasn't so much that they were looking for something that would uh, provide immediate and tangible commercial benefits to the organization. They, they were more interested in um, how could they connect to their uh, employees and to the scientists and the people who uh, make that company what it is. And this, to them, was a challenge. And they said, you know, no one's done this. We have the computing power. We have the, the, the talent here to do it. We'll partner with you on it. And so it was a unique sponsorship. We, we've never had one like that. Typically, at least when you're on the media side dealing with sponsors, you know, they give you some money and they get their name on the show. Here, they said, no, 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 we'll, we'll give you some money, but we want to be a partner in it. And so we're using their technology and their computing capability uh, to bring this data together and to help uh, understand it. I just want to build on Albert's point about multidisciplinary work that goes on here. I think what you've got to see is a lot of the technical aspects of what we do. But one of the most important things that's starting to happen is the integration of social sciences. Mm. So I was very interested in your response to what Tom Levy asked you about uh, geotourism and so on. So are there some problems that you have or challenges that a team of truly multidisciplinary, meaning cutting across some fields that normally don't come together, can work with? Yeah, yeah. I, there, you know, and, and there, there are probably <clears throat> uh, opportunities that we just haven't figured out yet. Uh, we're still understanding your capabilities and, uh, you know, you clearly haven't had a chance to absorb all of the various interests that we have. 
Uh, but my guess is that over the coming months, we're going to identify other opportunities that we hadn't thought about. Um, I mean, I see some immediate uh, uh, potential now, uh, some fairly obvious ones with archaeology and anthropology uh, but, uh, and the, the imaging technology that you have. But my guess is it's going to go way beyond that. Hey, I had a question for you. Uh, you've mentioned a few things, uh, a few of the projects that you were working uh -huh. on. Uh, needing some political kind of uh, swindling ahead of time. I was wondering what you had to say about that, how much of your effort goes into it, how well recognized National Geographic is in various parts of the world, and in general, what sort of a challenge does it pose for you to say, oh, we want to do this, what do we have to do to the people that are local to wherever this is going to happen? What, you know, what interaction do we have to have with them to make it possible? Mm. You know, it, 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 it'll vary from country to country, um, but, uh, Number one, we don't pay for access. Uh, we don't pay for stories. Um, we don't um, uh, provide uh, compensation to government officials. Uh, what we hope is that our reputation is such that when we go into a country uh, and make a request to do work there, that. Uh, they recognize that the organization has certain standards that will be objective and that will tell the story based on the facts. Uh, and so that's the approach. Uh, what I, I was referring to the fact that this, <clears throat> at times it can be useful uh, to uh, be with National Geographic because people, I mean, it's, we have a brand that people know and not just in this country but everywhere. Uh, and there have been situations where a number of us who, who have been in the field have had to use that. Um, I got stuck in, uh, well, I've been stuck in a lot of places, but I got stuck in, in uh, due to a, a, a uh, foul up by our wonderful travel office uh, in Khartoum once um, without a visa and uh, was carted off by these teenagers with AK-47s who uh, weren't going to let me leave and sat me down in a room for about six hours and finally you know, after talking to them and just telling, you know, National Geographic, pulled out my card. One of the guys had heard of National Geographic and had actually seen the magazine and uh, said, oh, National Geographic, uh, okay, 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 and got out. Um, other times it doesn't work so well. Um, but, I mean, that, that, that was what I was referring to. And a lot of our photographers and writers have, uh, have encountered that. Uh, so it's... Maintaining that reputation is perhaps one of our uh, most important uh, objectives in the organization, that uh, we continue to retain the qualities of the brand, this reputation for honesty and objectivity, because once that's gone, that's it. We're, we're no different from any other uh, organization and certainly no different from uh, any media company. Well. Thank you very much.